Hey everyone, welcome to Module 7, Contractors, The Five Rules. Today we're going to talk about contractors, how we manage them, where we find them, how to pay them, and just how to deal with them. So, there's, I have my kind of like five general rules of dealing with contractors, and it's contractors are one of those areas in this business that a lot of people freak out about. It's It's one that causes them to worry and and they think well i don't know this business i don't know how to build a house how am i going to be able to hire somebody to do that how am i going to hire somebody to pick out the the materials i need for my project the number one rule in contractors you do not have to be a construction expert i'm not a construction expert you don't have to be one so it's it's pretty pretty simple you do not have to be a construction expert. Don't worry about it. I'm going to give you some safeguards throughout this module that will help you um, just protect yourself through this process because that's the biggest thing about doing this business. I want you to be protected. I want you to do this safe. So I'm going to go through how you can be safe without being a construction expert. My second rule... <laughs> Do not lift a hammer, all right? You as a real estate investor, you should not be lifting hammers. It's as simple as that. Hammers, paintbrushes, whatever. Don't do it. We'll talk a little more on that. Uh, the third rule, always get three quotes. That's one of our major safeguards in this business. You get three quotes. Fourth rule, I call it check before check. So if somebody's asking for money for a check from you, you better make sure that they did what they're supposed to before they get paid. Because if you didn't see it, if you didn't see proof of it done, you shouldn't be paying for it. Check before check. And the fifth rule on contractors, you never stop looking for contractors. You need them in this business. Just like you need properties, you need money, you need contractors. You need all three of those to flip a house. So let's go a little more in depth on, uh, on these rules. So I said you don't have to be an expert in construction. You don't have to know the difference between sheetrock and drywall, um, ceramic and porcelain tiles. You, you don't have to know all those things. But how do you decide what you're going to put in your flip? What type of materials you're going to do? It's really easy, guys. You take a look at your comparable sales, the ones that you use to determine your ARV, your after repair value. You take a look at those comparable sales or even a project that you did before and you give that address to the contractor. Now, the contractor is not going to go out to the property and go walk it because you know someone's living there and they're not going to let them in. But what they can do uh, and what I do, I, I usually just um, Zillow will have a link to the property that was involved in the listing and sale of it. And it'll have a lot of interior photos on it. Excuse me. And a good contractor or even a mediocre contractor is going to be able to look at these pictures and they're going to see the product that you want to put out. They're going to see what type of flooring you're putting in what rooms. They're going to look at light fixtures and say, oh yeah, I know that light fixture. They sell it for $59 at Lowe's. Or, okay, you want to put 20-inch tile in the floors, uh, in, the, in the wet areas. The wet areas are the ones with laundry room, bathroom, kitchens, the ones where sinks where there's water wet areas um so the contractors can go through and he's just say i want my house to look like this or i want mine to look like this but a little bit better so they there might be a cheaper granite that somebody put into a house and uh by cheaper it's going to look kind of like salt and pepper or they might have put for mica uh for mica is like this desk that's you know this is this is not real wood but that's okay it still works it has a purpose it works but in our flips even in my rental flips, my low-end um, properties, when I'm doing them for resale, I still put granite in because the difference in price between Formica and granite, it's not that much more, and it can be done cheaply. They actually make prefabricated slabs of granite countertops, so you don't have to get a big 8 by 10 foot slab of granite and then have it cut to size. They have prefabricated slabs. And then all they have to do is 
cut them to the length of the counter or cut out the sinks in them. So there's all these different things that contractors can do, and they know where to get these materials from. They, they, they're pretty good at sourcing material because the better they source material, the more money they can make because they're still going to try to charge you the same. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So I do not tell my contractors where to shop either. I have contractors that I know shop almost exclusively at Lowe's and almost exclusively at Home Depot so that they're either or. And the big box stores are great because if you're doing this um, investing remotely, doing it across the country, it's really easy to take a look at the materials that are going to be going into the house if you want to go take a trip to like Home Depot or something like that to see what the light fixtures are. But don't tell them where to shop. Just give them the idea. You want it to look modern. You want brushed nickel or oil rug bronze uh, or brass. Please don't do brass. The houses are not going to sell that much more. Brass is the gold colored uh, fixtures. Um, the house is not going to sell for more. It'll have less buyers that want it because it doesn't look as modern or as clean as the today's buyers want. Uh, very few buyers desire brass fixtures. And when I'm saying fixtures, I'm talking everything from doorknobs and hinges to lights to uh, levers on the toilets. You want to have everything uniform and matching in your house. So you express that to your contractor. I want the house to look nice, clean. Everything has to work and be functional. And I want my house to look like this one. And you just give them the address of the property. So you do not have to be the expert in construction or design. And chances are your contractor has done a few remodels before. And he's going to have some input to you or for you. And your realtor will too. And especially if you're doing your remote investing and you have a solid pair of boots on the ground and you're using a realtor for that or somebody else, uh, uh, preferably a, a third party that's going to be your eyes and ears on the ground, that's your boots on the ground, uh, they can help out with those type of uh, features and, and uh, design aspects. Because it's hard to decide if you should open up a wall or not just by looking at a video or uh, pictures of a room from 2,000 miles away. But if you have a conversation with somebody that's not charging you for the removal of a wall and they say, yeah, you should do that. It, oh, wow, I can see the vision of that. Or I don't know why you're doing that, man. Don't, don't do that. That's a waste of money. The, the, you're going to have conversations like that with your boots on the ground in your remote investing. We'll talk more about that in a later module. So rule number one, you don't have to be the expert in uh, construction. It's okay. Now, you should take some time and go to Home, home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, most major cities have uh, cabinet warehouses uh, uh, where they have a lot of Chinese-made but still high-quality uh, materials such as the, the cabinets, the countertops, even sinks and faucets. I get all of my sinks, and I know this because my contractors tell me where they get it. Uh, I get all my sinks from these same stores. And instead of charging, like for a kitchen sink, instead of uh, spending three, four, five hundred dollars for a kitchen sink at Home Depot or Lowe's, I believe my kitchen sinks are $145 for the same thing. But it's at these different stores and it's the sourcing of materials. My average kitchen price for a, a standard remodel where I'm actually doing cabinets, full appliances, is about between, depending on the size of the kitchen, the amount of countertop space, the amount of cabinets, the price is going to be somewhere between seven and $9,000. Now, you have to know in your market if your houses need refrigerators in there, because that'll be another about $1,500. And how do you know if you need a refrigerator? Do you just trust your realtor? No. You look at your comps. If your comps all sold with real, or if your comps all sold with refrigerators, you should sell with one too. You want to look as good as the comps that you're determining your ARV from. If your house doesn't look like those, it's not going to sell at that price. So, that's where your design ideas come from. That's where your your uh, decision to go oil rug bronze or brushed nickel. Brushed nickel is the silver look and a more modern look. That's how you decide on these things. 
but you don't have to be the expert. You shouldn't be spending all of your time picking out, well, this beige tile looks a little better than this beige tile, right? It, it's not that big of a deal. It's gonna be new tile. You just don't want it to look so out of the, uh, the realm of everything else, meaning uh, very intricate designs, something that really jumps out at people and might scare them away. Keep it neutral. And my idea when I'm rehabbing houses, I put the money in to things that the normal homeowner is not going to replace. The cabinets, tile flooring, even though I'm only spending about a dollar a square foot for my tile, for the tile flooring, that doesn't include labor, grout, um, uh, for, the, for that, but it's in thin set. Uh, that's what holds it down to the floor. Um, but I'm only paying about a dollar for that uh, material. So all in, I'm paying about $3 a square foot for a nice 20-inch tile floor. But I'm putting a nice tile in where other people might put a 12-inch tile, which is smaller and has more lines and just looks a little bit cheaper. But it, it's not something a normal homeowner is going to replace themselves. The, the tile flooring, um, the cabinets, the countertops, those are all things that they're not going to change. But what homeowners do change is carpet. I don't put expensive carpet into my houses. Even in my upgraded houses, my, my, my bigger uh, houses, I still don't put upgraded carpet in there because that's a buyer's choice thing. Light fixtures. I don't spend a lot of money on light fixtures either, especially like ceiling fans. Now you have to know your market, uh, and you do know it by looking at your comps. If you need to put ceiling fans in, your comps will have ceiling fans. Most markets, you might want to just put one in the living room, maybe one in the master bedroom, and that's it. Because a light fixture is an easy thing for a homeowner to replace. So keep that in mind when you're, you're picking out some of this stuff. Homeowners can replace appliances. We do a basic appliance package stainless steel appliances, and it'll be, in most markets that I'm in, it's going to be a stove, microwave, and dishwasher. And you can typically get these from the big box stores for somewhere between eleven and $1,500 installed. It's really that cheap. So when you see your contractor charging you three, dollars $4,000 for something like that, you might want to question it. Because if I, I saw that special at Lowe's, Oh, but I'm putting in much nicer appliances. Do you really have to put in the much nicer appliances? If you're doing the upgraded remodels, yeah, you might have to. But on your lipsticks and your rentals and even your standard remodels, a brand new stainless steel set is going to trump anything else. Just put that in. So look at your comps. You don't have to be the expert in construction. Now, you do have to let your contractor know that, hey, this is a flip and it has to pass inspection. Because when you go to sell this property, the buyer is going to get a home inspection. They're going to get an appraisal. People are going to be walking through the house, poking at it, opening things up, testing the outlets, and, and making sure everything works. It has to pass inspection and it has to pass some of the current codes that are out there. In the uh, Western states, we have uh, seismic straps on our water heaters so that they don't fall off during an uh, earthquake and explode or shoot through your roof. You know, it's safety, things like that. Those have to pass inspection. Now, down in Florida, you have to have your roof tied on for, for, for the hurricanes. I mean, it's not just tied on with ropes. It's, uh, you know, built into the structure. So, but your contractors are going to know that because guess what? They're contractors from that local market. That's how you lean on them, but you just tell them it's got to pass pass inspection, it's going to pass code. When the inspector comes back through here, takes a look at the house, if there's any repairs that are need to be made, you're going to have to do a Mr. Contractor, so just be aware of that. So you don't have to be the expert. Rule number two, and I can't stress this one enough, don't lift a hammer. Don't lift a paintbrush. Don't do anything. Uh, if you remember when I said talked about my first flip I did and I was installing a light fixture and I got electrocuted, it's going to happen to you. 
okay? Be prepared for it. It's not fun. Uh, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to get covered in paint. And you're going to work for an hourly wage. That's not why you're doing this business. You're not doing this business to have a second job where you can make as much working at uh, a Burger King or or um, Wendy's or even working as a handyman for another contractor. That's not why you're doing this job. You're doing this job for the bigger picture. If you want to make $250,000 in a year, let, let's kind of break that down. So January 1, I give you a bank account with $250,000 in it. But you can only collect it December 31st. So what you have to do to earn that money by the end of the year there's 50 working weeks in the in the year. So we take 250,000 and divide by 50. Each one of those working weeks has 40 hours in it, 40 working hours. Now we can work more than that. Yeah, I, I get it. And I, I do work more than that because I want to keep pressing and keep furthering my path. But if you take 250,000, divide by the 50 weeks, divide by the 40 hours, that equates to $125 an hour. Are you going to get paid $125 an hour to paint a wall? Are you going to get $125 an hour to hang drywall? Rake a, rake a yard, mow a, mow a lawn? No, you're not cleaning a swimming pool. No, you have to do the work that's going to make you that $125 plus. And in this business, it's finding the houses connecting with the money people, and hiring the contractors. That's how you do it. You go through this, this process, and you're gonna, your hourly wages are going to go through the roof when you get your ball rolling. Um, I actually I was making $150 an hour before I started investing full-time. That's how lucrative real estate investing, uh, flipping houses can be for you. But think about that. When you're looking to, oh, you know, let me go grab that screwdriver and fix this uh, cabinet door. You know what? You're going to spend 10, 15 minutes doing something. You could have sent a, te a text message to the contractor and say, hey, the cabinet door is loose. This one in the picture, fix it. 20 seconds or 15 minutes. At the end of the year, every time you did hourly work that was $10 an hour, $15 an hour, that $250,000 dropped and dropped and dropped. And that's why most people have 40000 at the end of the year or 60000 at the end of the year because they focus on that small stuff. You, as the real estate investor, do not lift a hammer. Do not lift a paintbrush. All right? Don't do it. Now, I talked about safety. With contractors, you want to be safe. Um, you got to get three quotes. Three quotes on every job. I still get three quotes on every job because I want to keep my contractors honest. I have guys that only work for me. I have, I have multiple crews that only work for me, but I get multiple bids on every project. And I don't give every project to the one contractor, obviously, because I'm getting three bids. I let them know. I want to keep them honest. If you only have one contractor and he's bidding out all your projects and doing all your work, what happens around November and he's bidding a job for you and he starts thinking, well, kids are going to be out of school. I haven't taken a vacation for a while. Malibu sounds nice. You know, maybe I want to go take the kids to Disney World in Orlando. I'm going to have to pay for that. Well, let's bump this bid up a little, right? They'll do that. You know, they'll, they'll start planning their vacations off of your dime. Now that you want to pay them so they're happy and, and they work, but you have to keep them honest. All of a sudden you see your paint going from a dollar or a dollar fifty a square foot for the interior of the house up to three dollars. And you call them out on it and say, Well, why is paint so high on this one? Oh, well, it's got bigger walls. Not that much bigger. So uh, that's why we always get three quotes. And when we're getting quotes from our contractors, it's really important that you get a line item qu 
quote, meaning that they're putting interior paint $1,500, exterior paint $1,500, uh, appliances $1,400, so that it's it's all built out like that. Now, I don't need to see 37 outlets, 52 um, uh, switches. Um, I, I don't need to see the counts. I don't really care about that. I'm, I'm just looking for the bulk items. I'm not going to go back through that house and count all of those, right? That's not what I'm going to do. So I'm not going to double check if it was 37 or 47 or, or 25, whatever. I don't care. I'm looking at that final number and I'm going to compare it to the other guys because I want to see, does it make sense? Now, one of the things you have to really remember on this, some contractors make money in different line items. So it's the final number that really is the biggest um, um, deciding factor with your contractors. It's not the only factor, but each line item, they could be making money, they could be breaking money, or <laughs> breaking money, breaking even, they could be losing money even, or not making money at all, or, or they could make a huge amount on one item because that's just kind of where they threw it. So each contractor is different on the way they do it. So when you're comparing them, you want to see, okay, these guys, you know, a couple hundred bucks here and there, not a big deal. But then you get to like doorknobs and doorknobs in the house. You have two of your contractors are $300 and $320. And then this other guy's like $1,200. You're going to be like, whoa, he's trying to rip me off. No, maybe, maybe he just doesn't know the material I want. Maybe he doesn't understand. Uh, huge difference in prices in doorknobs. This is the throughout the house. There's knobs, which are just the round ones, and then there's levers, which you just you know go like that with. Levers are going to be more expensive. Uh, they're going to be anywhere between uh, twenty eight dollars up to fifty, sixty, seventy dollars for some of these, depending on your design. Don't pay that much. <laughs> you don't have to. So you're going to want to say, hey, Mr. Contractor. I was looking at the bid. Why are we so much on doorknobs? And he's probably going to come back and say, well, the levers are pretty expensive. They're about 35 bucks a piece. Okay, cool. I don't need those. Just do the knobs. How much are those? Eh, about eight bucks. Great. Can you revise the bid? You can have back and forth with them. Again, just like contracts, it's a conversation with the, the contractor about his bid. You can have back and forth. And the reason why you also get three bids, remember I said safety, if you just looked at the bottom line and go, oh, I'm going with the cheapest guy, that might not have everything on there. He might have missed something. He might not even have doorknobs on that bid, but you see it on the other ones. So you got to go back to him and say, hey, buddy, you didn't get this on here. Can you can you get that on there and this? Uh, it's You don't want change orders. Once you're into a project, you've decided on your contract or you're moving forward, and they're like, oh, hey, hey, we, do you want doorknobs in this house? <laughs> yeah. Of course I do. Like, all right, well, um, that's going to be $4,000. $4,000? What? It's just the price, man. Deal with it. Change orders are where some contractors make a lot of money. Instead of uh, $4,000 is obviously an exaggeration. But uh, they've got you tied into them, right? You're, you've already working with them. You don't want to change uh, midway along the journey of the, the remodel. It's, it's just a pain in the butt and they kind of know that there's these guys out there that just live off of change orders they make so much money on them don't get caught in that cycle now if something happens and you open up a wall and there's an issue and you have to change uh, plumbing around to add in the bathroom you want to, whatever the case is that kind of stuff does happen but simple things like doorknobs or appliances or shelving in closets uh, that should all be caught at the front so you know what your budget's going to be. And that's why you get those three bids, the line item bids, and you compare them next to each other. And the cheapest is not always the best. Remember that. You got to go with your gut, with your heart, and go with who you feel the best about. Now, I'm going to talk more about getting quotes and how we do that, but you really got to, if you got a bad feeling about somebody, even though they're the cheapest, they rub you the wrong way, whatever, move on. It's not the way to start a relationship. Now, check before you check. That's my, my rule number four. Everyone gets nervous about paying contractors. 
about contractors running away with your money. There's safeguards that we put in place so that this doesn't happen. I haven't had a contractor run away with money in probably three years. And that was only because he disappeared because he went to jail. <laughs> it happens. Um, but you have safeguards that you put in place. Now, one of those safeguards is how you pay them to start the project. There's contractors out there that have absolutely no money of their own, and they need your money to pay their car bill, right? So they say, I need 50% of the job up front. Well, if it's a $40,000 job and they're asking for $20,000 up front, that's pretty excessive. And I tell them, that, hey, man, that's, that's way too much. Oh, I got to order materials. Well, don't you have to do demo first? Don't you know? Don't you have to do some of this stuff before you can start putting in cabinets? How about we wait on that? And what I do, I give about ten percent to my contractors to start. So just ten percent. So if that's forty thousand uh, dollar bid, I give them about four thousand dollars. Now it can vary, but uh, you know, if it's a if it's a eight thousand dollar bid, I'm not just going to give them eight hundred bucks. I might give them two thousand. My my minimum is usually two twenty five hundred, depending on the size of it. And what that initial money goes for, demo and dumpster fees. A dumpster can run from, these are those big commercial dumpsters that they're going to throw in your driveway of the project, three to $500 for that. But it's not that much. If you have a whole bunch of junk in the house, if it was a hoarder house, they might say, hey, I need, I need to get three dumpsters for this house. We got a whole bunch of demo coming. Can I get a little bit more? But on a $40,000 job, 4000 should cover that. And what I tell them, I'll give you 10% to start. But if you need another check in two or three days, and you guys have already knocked out demo, I'm happy to do that. Because I know that you're only going to be working if you're getting paid. So I get that. I want to keep you happy. But I'm not going to plunk down 50%. So that's how I deal with paying contractors. Now, before I give them the next check, I check before I check. I go out to the property if it's nearby or I, I send a, uh, my boots on the ground or I have the contractor do a video walk through the house with me so he can say, all right, this is what we've done. He can kind of give me a, a couple minute uh, walk through on the house. And I say, okay, great. Uh, the check is uh, at the office or I'll drop it by at, uh, um, at the work site or you know, some sort of, uh, some even take a direct uh, deposit into their accounts. It all depends on the contractor and how sophisticated they are, really. But you got to keep paying them to keep moving forward. But you only pay them if the work is getting done. Check before you check. And I'll even go as far as saying, if they tell me, oh, I ordered the cabinets, so can I get uh, the next uh, next 25% of the the, uh, the quote? Say, it sounds pretty early to be ordering cabinets, can I see the bill? If they ordered them, there, there's going to be something, some sort of proof showing that they ordered them. They can't provide that. They're just trying to get money to pay for their car. So check before you check. Now, I've said some, you know, contractor going to jail, people trying to pay for their cars, right? That's one reason why you never stop looking for contractors. You always have to be. Because contractors... The, the grass will be greener on the other side. They'll be working for you for a while, and then the new, new, prettier uh, uh, home flipper is going to come in and say, hey, why don't you work for me? I saw you were working for Luke. I'll, you know, do mine. And they're like, well, you know, all right, I'm going to take a project. You got to keep looking for more contractors. You got to treat them right, too. You got to keep them happy. You got to listen to what they're saying and what they're not saying because you want to keep good contractors. You don't want to have to overpay for them to keep them, though. But you want to keep them busy, and you want to just keep them happy. Now, when I'm looking for new contractors, the way I do it, I, I, I pick a small job. I like to start a contractor on a small job. One of my lipstick remodels, um, I would like a rental remodel, one of the lower-end ones, because I don't want to start them off on a hundred grand remodel. Because if they don't work out, I'm going to have to kick them to the curb 20 grand in i want to start them something small where i can test them out now i don't now i'm telling you get three quotes right does that mean i call three contractors 
and just wait for them to come to the house and give me quotes. No, it's the kind of rule of thumb is you have to 10 to three, 10 contractors to get three written quotes. It sounds like a lot of work and it is contractors, no matter what stage in this business you are, it's always a lot of work, especially when you're doing it remotely. 10 to three. Now what's going to happen? You're going to contact your contractors. We'll talk about how to find them, but you're going to contact the contractors and you're going to have a back and forth with them. And you're going to just say, Hey, do you work with flippers? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. You know, I'd love for you to quote one of my projects, uh, my, my next project I get. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. You have that beforehand so that when you do get your project, you're in your due diligence time frame. Remember due diligence contract is accepted. Yes. Awesome. High five. What do I do? I reconfirm my ARV and I get my contractors. This is where I'm calling 10 contractors. The guys I've already talked to once before. Now I'm saying, Hey Mike, Hey Jane, you know, whoever the contractor is, I need you to come out to the house. Got it. When can you come out here? Oh, I can get out there tomorrow, tomorrow at like nine o'clock. Awesome. Perfect. You call up the next one. 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, three o'clock, the next day at two o'clock until you get 10 out to that house because this is what's going to happen. Mike, who is a nine o'clock appointment, forgot about it, didn't write it down, doesn't show up. You call him up, say, Mike, what's going on? You're not here. Oh, yeah, I got stuck at this job on the other side of town. How's, how's uh, maybe Wednesday at three work? Okay, man. Yeah, let's let's do that. If you can make it sooner, let me know. But I'll put you in the book. That's gonna happen. It's gonna happen with a couple of these guys. Remember, ten to get three. So a couple, you're gonna call and say, "Hey, where are you?" You know, let, you leave them a message, send them a text. No answer. They're at the bar. They're you know at their kids' baseball game. They're just you know laying on the couch watching TV. That's the way it goes, no responses. It's like, I'm trying to give you money, man. Come quote this job. So that's another couple of them. Now you're going to have five or six or seven show up at the house. They're going to walk through. You're going to get the guy that walks in and says, this is a big project. Look him right in the eyes. Say, Oh, if this is too big for you, I can get somebody else to do it. And they're like, oh, no, no, I, I, I can do it. It's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do, right? It's that with that, woo, big project, whoa, woo. <laughs> that's that's contractor way of building the bill up. They're, you know, it's they want to make it look like it's going to be a big project. It's not. Every job is just a lot of little jobs put together. It's simple. It's easy. So just remember that every job is a bunch of little jobs put together. So then of those five, six, seven that come out to the property, before before they leave, you're going to go through and say, um, when can I have that bid by? Some of them are going to give it to you that night. Some are going to say, well, I got to get my subs out here. It's their subcontractors. I'm going to get my subs out here and you know maybe I can get to you by Friday. Great. The sooner the better. Um, let me know because it's, you know, just the way it's got to be. I make a decision on this house and I need that bid. Now, if you're having trouble accessing that property, because remember, this property is under contract to buy. You have it under contract to buy. So your realtor might have to be there to let them in with the lockbox. Um, or if it's an owner-occupied property, you want to let these guys know ahead of time, hey, listen, if you need a sub along with you, or if you need to take pictures, do that. You're not going to be able to get back into this house. So plan on measuring uh, everything you need to do at this one appointment. So you'd be preemptive with that. So that way you'll get the bids back sooner. It's just easier. You get through all the bids, you know, you get through all the appointments for them to see the house. You get the one guy that sends it that night. Um, then you get another guy that sends it the, the following day. Where's the other three, four, five bids? You call the guys. Oh, yeah. Um, I got hung up on another job. I'll get that to you later. Another guy doesn't answer. And the other guy goes, oh, you didn't get that email? Let me send it over to you. And you end up getting only three 
out of 10. It's just the way numbers work. You've got to do this process. Now, when, I, when I'm hiring contractors, I will, like I said, we'll talk more about where we find them. I want to see their work. I don't want to hear about it. When I get new contractors, I want to go out to a project that they're actually on right now or have my boots on the ground do it or my realtor do it so that we can actually get eyes on the quality of their work. If you get into there and everything, it's a mess. It's its like a frat house or something. And, it, you know, there's beers everywhere. It's not clean. That's not the contractor for you. You want a safe, clean working environment. Contractors are everywhere. Never stop looking for them. So again, here's just the five rules real quick here. Number one, you don't have to be the expert. Lean on the contractors, lean on your realtors, lean on your boots on the ground, and show them what you want the house to look like. Number two, you don't lift the hammer. Paintbrush, you don't do the work. $125 an hour or $10 an hour. What work do you want to do? Always three quotes. Ten to get three. Check before you check. If you're going to give somebody money, make sure they've earned it. Okay, don't just hand that money out because you don't want them to run. Never stop looking for contractors. Super important, guys. In this business, you're always looking for properties. You're always looking for money. And you're always looking for contractors. So let's dig into where we find the contractors. Ideally... <laughs> And it's not always an ideal world, but ideally, you're going to have some referrals, contractors that were used by other people you know. And I'm not just talking about John and Jane's home repair and they painted your neighbor's house on the outside. You want people that can do everything. And the way I phrase it is when I'm talking to these contractors, hey, um, I'm looking for a contractor, somebody that can do everything for me, everything from A to Z. Can you do that? And for the big contractors, general contractors, a lot of them will say, oh, yeah, yeah, we can do that, no problem. And then you say, great. Is there anything you don't do? And then this is where they typically will throw in, oh, we don't do landscaping. We don't do pools. We don't do HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning. Um, you know, there's usually something that they don't do or this don't do roofing. So even though one breath earlier they said they do everything from a to z i still want to know what they don't do because there's usually something that they don't do now it's fine if they don't do one or two of those things you, you want to make sure that they can do all the painting the cabinets the countertops all that or they have somebody that can oh you don't do pools great do you know a pool guy yeah yeah i got somebody i can call perfect when i get my next project under contract i'm going to call you up for a quote Thank you. So referrals are great because you want them to be vetted by somebody else. They've worked for somebody else. You know that they're reliable. Somebody's not going to refer somebody to you if they're horrible at their job. Now, where do you get these referrals? Your realtors are going to be a great resource for these. Other flippers uh, from your local real estate investment clubs, from your online Facebook groups, uh, and also from friends and family, there's going to be contractors out there and you just got to let people know you're looking for them. Now, something I started doing when I was having trouble finding new contractors as you know, I was out uh, driving to my projects and I, these neighborhoods I was in, there was other houses that were being flipped, not by me, but I could tell they were being flipped because they had the big blue dumpster in front or depending on what your uh, municipality does. Some are orange, some are green. Uh, those are blue, green, orange are typical colors for them. Uh, that kind of tells you that the house is being flipped or worked on. So what you can do is you, you stop, pull over, walk on in, introduce yourself. Hello, anyone here? I'm here to look at the, uh, the project. Just who, who's in charge? Try to get a, a hold of the guy that's in charge there. If no one's there, I started carrying around a like a four by eight piece of bright yellow paper that had my name, my phone number, and I'm looking for a contractor. Call me 
written on it. So I had pre, pre, pre-typed and I would stick them right into the dumpster. It's just kind of like in between where the metal was uh, there so they could see it sticking out of there. And I got calls off of them. It's all different ways to find contractors. But you see these ones, these guys are actively doing projects. Now you can take a look inside the dumpster and see what kind of project they're actually doing. Now, if it's just a bunch of trees, uh, branches, and things like that, it's probably just landscaping. Might not be the one you're looking for. But if there's, if you see cabinets and toilets and drywall in there, that most likely is a flip or a full remodel contractor. That's somebody you want to talk to. And if that house is on your route, keep swinging by it. Pay attention to it. I've done that. I've watched a whole house being built. And I've I talked to the contractor on my second or third trip past the house. And I went back when it was getting done. And I went into it and said, oh, wow, you guys did a good job. You want to quote one for me? And they did. Now, I've also done that where I got to the house at the finish of the project. I was like, oh, good job, guys. See ya. Because <laughs> they didn't do a good job and I wouldn't want them on my project. Uh, doors were had big gaps at the bottom. Uh, tile wasn't laid straight. Uh, uh, just finishing was not done. And finishing hurts your resale value. So pay attention to that. So construction sites is a good place to find them. Um you can find them at uh, like Home Depot and Lowe's. Now, I'm not saying you just walk around to the guys that are sitting in front of the Home Depot and Lowe's. I never hired those guys. They could be good. They could be bad. I only want companies. I'm looking for companies, people that actually uh, are doing work right now. I don't want, I'm not going to hire the guy off of the Home Depot front to uh, front stoop. But you can go inside and talk to the contractor desk. The, uh, where the where all the contractors go buy their materials in bulk. Say, hey, man, I'm I'm flipping some houses. I really need a new contractor. You, and you talk to the the guy behind the counter or the guy or gal, and just let them know what you're doing. And you know what? Chances are they probably have some regulars that they can recommend, or at least take one of your cards and hand them out for you. So that's a good way to find them. Now, there's a website out there called thumbtack.com uh, you might have seen the commercials for it on the uh, TV and what it is it's basically an internet cork board and you can find almost any service you want on there everything from uh, I think they even do like computer repair and graphic design now on thumbtack.com but it's for general contracting you can put it up there and if it, it's basically here click you know here's my job I'm a real estate investor. I'm flipping houses. I'm looking for a contractor. And I just put up general information about any house. 2,000 square foot house. I'm remodeling kitchen, bathrooms, uh, garage, and living room. Something like that. Full remodel. Need to start as soon as possible. And um, I don't put any pictures or an address or any of that kind of stuff up there. Uh, you do have to put a zip code in uh, on typically on these sites. There's a few other ones besides Thumbtack. But I do that. And then now that job's up there. And a contractor that wants work is going to call you or email you. And now you're not cold calling contractors out of the yellow pages where half of them don't even want to work with a flipper. In your note, you're, you're saying, right, what you're doing. I'm flipping houses. I've got this one. Boom. Now, when you call them or they contact you, you call them back and just say, yeah, this is what I'm doing. You know, you, have, you found me on Thumbtack. Uh, what do you do? Uh, how much can you do everything from A to Z? And then you have to do the follow-up question. What don't you do? Great. You know what? My next project I get under contract, I'll have you come quote it out. Because I don't want to waste your time or mine going and looking at properties that I don't have control of. Now notice what I said there. I don't want to waste your time or mine. Because who's important here? Not just the contractor or not just the realtor or whoever you're talking with here. You, the real estate investor, you are important. So you have to remember that. They're, they're working for you. They're, you're the one writing the checks. So thumbtack.com is great. You know, if you need a cleaning service, if, if you need a, a pool guy, whatever, it's all on there. Go on there, check it out. Thumbtack.com. Uh, a few other websites. We got uh, like Angie's List. Uh, you have to, there's a small membership fee for that one. 
thehomemag.com. And that's the home magazine, the home magazine.com. It's in only, uh, I think it's in like 18 cities, but that's a spot where, you know, they mail it out to you where cabinet stores, kitchen remodelers, all, all different people in, um, uh, advertise in this magazine, but it's also online. So you can click on their links and you can find contractors off of that. Great, nice, uh, resource. And Craigslist actually has a spot in there too where you can find contractors or you can also post for contractors all different ways to find contractors as long as you let people know you need a contractor you got to let them know you'll get the referrals you get people reaching out to you they'll answer your thumbtack ads uh all different ways so let them know you need a contractor and it's always best to see their work in person before you hire them or if, if it, but if it's a referral from your realtor who says, oh, they've done my projects before and they've always done great, boom, that's that's good enough for me. But if it's somebody new that's answering an ad, I want to see their work. I don't want to just hear about it. So getting a quote. Once you've got them and you, you got, you're going for your 10 to 3, right? 10 people to come in to get your three quotes. I've already told them I'm flipping houses. So if they don't want to work with flippers, they know it. And the reason why they might not want to work with a flipper is because they think that we're all cheap or we cut corners. Now, we don't cut corners because that just comes and bite you in the end. You, you don't want to do that. Put out a nice product, a clean product, a safe product. So you, you let them know, hey, you know, I want to do my remodel. Uh, good. I want to be better than the rest. So and, and you let the contractor know, I know you're not going to work unless you're getting paid. So... Don't worry about that. I've got the funds. We're going to get you paid. We're going to get this project done. Now, I don't want them. I, I tell them up front, if you only bid retail, don't worry about coming out. Don't waste my time or yours because I'm not going to pay retail. This is an empty house. You get the full run of it. Utilities are on. Go out there. Do your thing. And I'll get another one lined up for you right after this one. I will keep you busy. I will keep you fed. That's what you want to do. And uh, scope of work, I tr make it easy for them. For that line item bid, you know, where the, you're comparing the three bids next to each other, a scope of work doesn't have to be in depth. It, all it is is going to be a line by line by line little email that you send them. And it just says what you want to do. Replace interior light fixtures, replace exterior light fixtures, uh, new cabinets, new countertops. And you can put to match property um, 123 Sesame Street. So you do that, you do that list for them so that when they walk the house, they know what they're looking at. But at the end of that list, you write and anything else you see that is needed. That way it's open-ended. Like, hey man, if you see other problems here, if you, if you have suggestions, I want to hear about it. This is not just the scope of work. This is the start of the scope of work. And remember, whew, this is going to be a big project. Okay, if you can't handle it, I could find somebody else. It's that simple. They'll shut up and they'll they'll walk through the property. That's that's the way you handle them. Um, don't let them walk all over all over you. You're the boss. You're the one writing the check. Every big job is made of small jobs. And once you've gotten those three bids and you've decided I'm going with I'm going with Mike's general contracting whatever company it is, you make that decision during your due diligence time frame. You call up Mike and say, hey, Mike, I'm closing on this house uh, February 11th. When can you start? If he says, oh, I can get on there March 20th. Mike, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to use you. <laughs> a month, month and a half of nothing. Every day that project is not working on, being moving forward, it's costing you money. If you're closing February 11th, you want them starting February 12th, and you're going to get the power turned on so that it's it's ready to go for them because there's going to be things that they need to do. They need water, and they need power. If they have water to paint, to power to run their drills, all that kind of stuff. There's ways to do it with generators. If, if you can't have it on, if there's a, uh, no power to the property yet, uh, solve problems. The contractor will know how to solve those problems, but you want to find out when they can get started, get them on the schedule. 10% up front, get some of the demo and the dumpsters and, and just keep paying them. Now, once you get a quote from them, 
you're going to go back and forth with them. And then you talk, okay, you're asking for 50% up front, 25% up front, whatever it is. Uh, you want a schedule of what they're expecting after that. You know, we're going to pay them 10% up front, but then we want a schedule of everything uh, for pay and for work. You don't want to just saying, okay, well, I'll take 10% February 12th to get started on the demo. And then I want another 20% uh, February 22nd. And then another 20% March 1st. You don't want it to just say that. You want to say, oh, February 22nd, I need 20%. And we will have completed all demo, uh, interior paints done, baseboards, and flooring in. Some, something like that. So the amount of work that's going to get done and what they expect to get paid. And if it comes to February 22nd and that work is not done, you don't have to pay them all that. But if they come back and say, well... I know we didn't get that done, but instead we put the showers in. We did all the tile work in the showers, which was going to be for the next payment. You know, there's a give and take. You want to keep the project moving. It's only going to be moving if you're paying them. But if they're not moving to the same speed of the pay, don't pay them the same. Okay? You control that. You write the checks. The way I do it in my business is I still make them request the checks. So I don't, it's not on me on February 22nd to write that. And what I do, I have all my checks I write on Friday. They have to request it on Wednesday. So what do I do on Thursday? Thursday is my day to check, to make sure that the work is done, right? You got to give yourself a little little time frame there. You want to check on Wednesday? Great. Or on uh, uh, for Friday? Better let me know on Wednesday, because if not, you got to wait till the next week. Stick to that. Keep them. You got to train them. And they'll, they'll be fine with it, uh, but take them a little bit. But... They'll be fine with it. Hold back the money if it's not done. If the work's not done, that said they said was going to be done. Hold it back. And I've done this with contracts before, contractors before, where I've penalized and rewarded. So when you have the the bid from them, it's going to say when they expect to be done with the project, March seventeenth. So I tell the contractor, okay, March 17th, we're six weeks out from this project being done. It's a $40,000 job. Uh, a typical contractor can get five to $10,000 worth of work done per week, depending on the size of the, the job and the, the project and everything. But if it's $40,000, six weeks should be more than enough. It shouldn't be three months. Now, in some cities, when you're having to pull permits and get code inspection, it can drag things out, but for standard uh, flips and remodel uh, lipstick flips, you don't really have to get all that code enforcement involved. Listen, cities are going to make you get a permit for painting the interior walls. You don't need that, okay? Now talk to, talk to your contractors and say, listen, any permits we need, get them, let me know about them, whatever. I don't, I don't know, just tell them, I don't know about permits. You handle all the permits. I don't want to be part of that, but let me know what we need them for. Because you want to know if there's going to be delays and an additional inspections. But you, again, don't have to be the expert. You rely on the contractors for that. But I reward my contractors if they finish early. Because if they finish early, what's that mean? I get the project on market sooner, and I get to sell it faster, and I make more money but get a better AROI, annualized return on my investment. If they take longer, it's going to cost me more. I have more carrying costs. So when I've done this with contractors before, I say, okay, March 17th, if you finish early, I'll give you an extra $100 per day. However, every day that you're late, I'm going to take away $100. So if we were $40,000, we're now $39,900, $39,800, $39,700. So, you know, it's got to be managed. If there are delays during the project, they need to vocalize to you, hey, our finish date has been extended because the cabinets you want are in back order. So we'll have to do another week on that or something. Okay. Anything like that, any changes, change orders have to be in writing with the change in date and any pricing. And you have to approve them. Okay. Real important. Now, another thing that really freaks people out is the paperwork. 
right? What kind of paperwork should you have with contractors? This is not an easy question <laughs> because every market is different. And not just on contractors, but the the way they work. Uh, I remember the first flips I did up in Reno, Reno, Nevada. And it is such a good old boy kind of area. And I mean that with no disrespect. But uh, um, I met with the contractor, walked him through the house, all that. And he's like, okay, I can do it for 50000 It's like, okay, well, send me over your bid and uh, we'll get started. And he sends me over a, uh, an email that says, I'll do everything we discussed for 50000 <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I wrote out everything we discussed <laughs> and put a couple little caveats in there for additional things uh, just to cover myself and you know put 50,000 and the, the terms we agreed on the 10% up front and all that and he replied okay <laughs> and we got started he did the job and it was great but there wasn't much paperwork there was a little risky but what I do always make sure I have with my contractors I have a W9 that means I'm not going to have to pay their taxes. I'm telling the government, hey, money from this project went to this guy. Go after him for taxes. A W-9. Uh, we've got a copy of that in the forms uh, package here for you. So you can use that, print it out. Always have anybody that you're paying, fill one out. You'll need one a year. Talk to your CPA, your accountant on it. They'll explain how it works. I get a copy of their driver's license. And I get a picture of their rear license plate. So I'm worried that a contractor is going to run away on me with my money, right? So the W-9, there's a spot where they have to put their address. Driver's license has an address on it. And a license plate, well, number one, the, the thing about the license plate, if their, their tag is expired on their license plate, they're not paying their bills, don't hire them. That's just a safeguard. So we want to keep you guys safe. Um, get those but uh paperwork can be extensive with some contractors a lot of general contractors will have their own package of paperwork and um, it's going to say what the scope of work is what's expected of each party uh, payments all that kind of stuff uh, you're writing the checks you're the boss somewhere in all of this uh back and forth you do want to let these guys know that you have a zero tolerance for smoking and drinking on your job sites. Zero tolerance. Because if people are drinking, it's going to slow them down and can cause accidents. It's just safety. It's smart, smart business. Um, you know, I'm I'm in a video studio right now and they're, they're not drinking on the job. I'm not drinking on the job. Your contractors handling heavy machinery, tools, saws should not be drinking on the job. And smoking on the job, nowhere on your property. Because guess what? If you're, the guys laying carpet are smoking, the smell gets into it. There's something about a new house smell, just like a new car smell. You don't want people to walk in and smell cigarettes. You don't want cigarette butts all over your yard. No drinking, no smoking. Um, okay, so back to the contracts with, uh, with contractors. Uh, the stuff that I want to make sure that I have written out somewhere, whether it's an email or their big form paperwork is the scope of work. That's going to say what they're doing and how much it's going to cost. The time frame and pay schedule, meaning when the project's going to be done, when pay is expected, and what's going to be done at each of those uh, pay periods. You want to make sure the contractor is insured. You can ask for a copy of his insurance. On bigger projects, you might want to be named on their insurance. Uh, it's just for safety in case something happens to the house. Uh, it's Again, you don't have to be an expert in insurance. You are going to have homeowner's insurance on your property. You're going to get that from State Farm or Allstate, one of those companies. Call them up and say, hey, what should I do for to safeguard myself with this contractor? Here's his insurance. Here's the job. They'll give you some free advice on that. Lean on the people that are the experts in that. You want to make sure that it says the contractor is responsible for paying and insuring their own subcontractors. 
You don't want the subcontractors coming after you later and saying, you never paid me. Like, man, I didn't hire you. I never had an agreement with you on paying you. You got to talk to Jim. Jim's the guy that hired you. Well, I don't have a, you know, it's your house. I'm going to put a lien on it. You have paperwork stating that the contractor is responsible for all that. It can take care of it. So you want to make sure it's clearly written somewhere. Contractor is responsible for paying and insuring their own subcontractors. Then number five, change orders have to be in writing with cost and dates if there's date changes for your final uh, end project, especially if you're doing bonuses or taking money away. And you still have to respond and approve them. And these change orders shouldn't all come at the end of the project. It should be happening when the change happens. Meaning, oh, we had to open up that wall and uh, uh, move the plumbing because the, the pipes were in the way. So that was an extra $800. Well, you could have let me know about that when you moved the wall, not six weeks later when you're asking for final payment. Because now I don't really have any proof of that, do I? So have to be in writing with cost and approved by you. Real important. So before you make your final payment to your contractors, it's important you do a final walk. Now, a contractor is going to do what they call their punch list. They should walk the property before they say they're done, and they're going to write down everything that they see that their their guys need to finish, that their workers need to finish. Um, and that's a punch list. So when a contractor tells me that they're done, I ask them, did you do your punch list? Oh, no, well, we're finishing it up tomorrow. Okay, great. Let me know when that's done. Three days later, he calls you back and says, okay, that punch list is done. Right? You don't want to waste your time. You want to know when it's actually done. So you say, okay, great. Um, the contractor is going to push for you to go walk the property with him because he wants his last check. And say, okay, well, I can be here at tomorrow at 10 o'clock if you want to walk it with me. You know, 10 o'clock doesn't work for me. I'll try to figure out my schedule and I'll get back to you. But if you say it's done, um, I'll try to get out there either way. Because you don't want the contractor there with you when you're doing the walk. Because he's going to point, see what we did up there? See all that, the texture on the ceiling? Man, we made that blend really good. Because he doesn't want you to see the wall over here where it looks like garbage. Okay? <laughs> you want to spend at least an hour on your walkthroughs. Get some of that painter's blue tape, and you're going to blue tape the house. Any of the little marks you see that you want fixed, anything that's not working, you're going to check every door. You're going to check every lock, every cabinet, every drawer. Make sure the appliances work, every light switch works, every uh, plug works even. Go through and double check the house. The contractor should have already done this, but you don't want to have problems when you get a home inspection when you sell the house. So the less problems you have, the more likely the transaction is to close. So you take care of them now, especially while the contractor is waiting for money, and he's going to be quicker to get these things done. So you blue tape it, but that's not all. Now, when you're blue taping a house, if there's something wrong with the ceiling, and it's a 12-foot ceiling, you don't need to pull out a ladder and you know put blue tape up there. You make an arrow out of the blue tape. Put it on the wall, pointing up. You can even write on the blue tape it's, uh, explaining what the problem is. Sometimes I'll open up a closet door, and I'll put the tape around the jam so that even if somebody comes and closes that door, they can see that there's blue tape, and it leads them into the closet and maybe uh, to whatever the problem is. Maybe they forgot the, the closet rod or the shelf or something. Um, so I blue tape it. I take pictures of every problem, and I write it down. It sounds like a lot of work, right? It is. <laughs> you got to do it. Plan for at least an hour. That's how long the normal 1,500 square foot house should take you. If it needs to take two, three, four hours, whatever, do it right, inside and out. Make sure everything works. Send that list to your contractor and tell him to let you know when it's done. He's going to go out there and, and carry the uh, take the bid with you too. Because if you paid him to do something and it's not done, you kind of want to make sure you know about that, right? Um, so when the contractor says it's done, you go do the exact same thing, or you have your realtor, or your boots on the ground, do it. And, uh, um, again, without the contractor and when you're satisfied, the house is better than good enough. It's never going to be perfect. Every time they go out to the house, they're going to cause more problems. 
carpets are going to get dirty. Um, they're going to be working on something and they're going to put their dirty hands on a wall and leave a handprint. Uh, you don't want to have them keep going out over and over and over. And it's going to co cost the contractor a lot of money to do that too. And he's going to get pissed off at you and he's not going to want to do another job. If, they're, if it was a good contractor, you can lose them at this point. So be very thorough on your first walkthrough. And then on your second walkthrough, look for additional things, but it has to be better than good enough. It's not going to be perfect. It never will be. So keep that in mind. You find a good contractor, you got to keep them busy. Whether it's you, if you have another project to put them on, great. That's awesome. One to one to one to one and keep moving them, keep them fed, and he can grow his crew and he can handle maybe two projects or three projects. Don't overwhelm them. If you have a guy that says, oh, I can do seven projects, it's probably too big of a contractor and he's charging too much. You want the guys that can do maybe two or three at most. Those are the perfect size contractors for you. But if you can't keep them busy, you've, you should have connected with other flippers in your area. Recommend the guy to them. Keep him fed. It, you know what? You're not going to lose him. You're gonna, he, if you were good, you guys worked good together, you paid him, he's going to get you on another job. Or you're going to get him on another job when you have your next house to flip. So um, you don't need to be the expert in construction. You know that. The contractor, there's all different levels of contractors. You don't need the guy who can build a, a skyscraper to do a lipstick remodel. Get the guy, right guy for the job. The guy that can only do one, maybe he does a lot of the work himself. You know what? He can do the carpet, the paint, the cabinets. He can hire out the granite. He can handle that small job. That might, that might even just be a handyman, not a full general contractor. So every market is different. Find out what kind of work these guys can do. But if it's a big job, you're opening up walls, you need to make sure supports are correct, you're doing a new roof, things like that, you should really go with a big general contractor that can handle those you know, three jobs at a time kind of guy. Not the real big fancy ones, but the guys who know what they're doing. Hire the right person for the right job. And everything has to be done safe, it has to be done right, it has to pass inspection, because when that home inspector comes through the house after you've uh, uh, got a contract on it, you want the work done right. So never stop looking for contractors. It's, it's one of those pieces that you need. And don't be afraid of it. You're going to talk to them. Let them know. It, you can tell them. Remember your real estate story? If your real estate story is that you did projects other places, you can let them know that your partner handled the, the contract or the contractor paperwork before. Uh, and so it's, it's a new part of your business that you're doing, that you're taking on a new hat for you to wear. Talk to them, let them know they're, they're just people and every big job is just a lot of small jobs together. So guys, contractors never stop looking for them. I probably said it 20 times during this module because you can never stop. Remember 10 to three sounds like a lot of work because it is. But once you find those three good contractors, you're going to keep them busy. You're going to do project after project with these guys and with these companies. And it's going to be great. But never stop looking. Don't be afraid of contractors. You guys have this. You don't have to be the experts. You don't lift a hammer or a paintbrush. And they're out there. You're going to find them. Good luck, guys. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,